And good evening to everybody and welcome to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Now we're in Series 13, Session 9, and a huge welcome to you. My name's Sue MacDonald. I'm the curator. I had to think about my title there for a minute. The curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Hour, as well as the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals. And it's my delight and pleasure to be with you this evening, chairing the session with our two wonderful guests, we have Claire Nutt and we have Teresa Shalofsky. And I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Teresa, or you'll yep. throw brickbats at me or something. Now, we always do this to our lovely guests and we ask them to share with us a moment of the week to just get us started before I go into the news bit afterwards. So perhaps, Teresa, you'd like to share your moment please yes so so <laughs> thank you thank you sue um my moment of the week is a very um selfish moment of the week because i have uh, today this evening finished packing for my holiday which starts on saturday <laughs> <laughs> and so i am absolutely getting in, in that sort of wind down mode now so Fabulous. That's a, now that's a fabulous thing. Not selfish at all, no. because <laughs> you need to look after yourself in order to look after everybody else and juggle all the millions of things that you do juggle, Teresa. Absolutely. Thank you. That's lovely. Lovely to share. Thank you. How about Claire? Uh, well, mine, mine's share. also <laughs> selfish in the way that it was kind of work related day that brings together three of my favorite things in the world. So on Friday, um, in respect to midwifery, massage and teaching, I um, led a massage for labour and birth workshop in Lancashire with the most wonderful group of student midwives and midwives and yoga teachers and educators. And it was just, you know, hands on sharing massage, brilliant food. It was just a, a glorious day that I miss that hands on kind of thing sometimes with working remotely as we do. So really leaned into that. Oh, that's wonderful. And I, I mean, I must say midwives and food midwives and cake <laughs> and then massage on top of that it sounds mm. that sounds absolutely lovely thank you so much that's got us off to a good start and I don't think either one is selfish because they're both about things that we need to do to kind of what's the word grow develop and prosper in ourselves and stay healthy which is really important so thank you to our lovely guests for sharing their moment of the week now I'm just going to sort of remind those of you who have come up every week, but also the people who are new new to the maternity midwifery hour. And if you're new, hello and welcome. Really glad you come you've come to be with us. This all started right at the beginning of the pandemic when we used to just do well. I say just we did festivals and study days and conferences, and we realised at the point of the pandemic when the first UK lockdown happened that we couldn't do that anymore obviously we weren't allowed to and we knew that midwives student midwives people who wanted to become student midwives as well as a lot of other people who worked in maternity services including maternity care support workers really wanted some Inf lots of information actually and connection with other people all over the place and they needed to know what people were doing in relation to the to coping with services during the pandemic so we started the maternity hour and initially obviously we did a lot about service changes how people were coping with the pandemic what people were doing to get to be able to provide care when a lot of things had to be much more distant um, and we what was amazing and fantastic at that time was the creativity and also the passion for making sure that care continued for mothers and babies and their families and that was fantastic and we've kind of continued and one of the important things you need to know if you're coming in for the first time is everything that maternity and midwifery forum does is recorded so you can access it so if you have a terrible power cut and your computer dies or you have to go and answer the door. You won't miss anything because you can catch up later because everything is looked after by Mapflix who archive everything. And we've got actually thousands of, of um, sessions now gathered up. So you can just go into the Mapflix and it's on your resources sheet that's available tonight. And you can go in and have a look and find out anything you want, really. And it's a really good resource if you're doing 
Oh, if you're doing anything from a, developing a dissertation to for doing assignment work as a student, if you're doing a project or an improvement project, there is masses and masses of material there, all from fantastic speakers, and it's all free. And also, if you're doing, oh, I nearly forgot the revalidation, very important for midwives, it's really fantastic for that because sometimes you might have heard someone speaking and think, I can't quite remember. Now, I've put something in my practice and I can't remember where I've got it from. And you go back and you see that's where it was from. So it's really helpful for that. Now, also, I'm just checking my time at the moment. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to everyone who's working so hard, as you always do. And that's a very sincere thank you, because it's hard work being in the health service at the moment. In, and if you're in the UK, you know that. But in the health service, wherever you are, I know we have a lot of people coming in from internationally all over the world. So a big hello to you and thank you for what you're doing wherever you're doing it, because we are all facing challenges in providing care to mothers and babies and families. And that needs to be recognised. And you need to look after yourselves. Now, Teresa has illustrated brilliantly how she's looking after herself, making sure she's getting a holiday. What she probably doesn't mention is she'll probably be working into the dead of night, trying to make sure everything's ready before she goes. But because we all do that. But we need to look after ourselves because that's the way we can look after others. OK, so that's my that, I'm getting off my soapbox now. Now, the news this week is World Homeopathy Week and it was World homeopathy day yesterday and there was a bit online yes and you might have noticed if you're a facebooker or if you're a tweeter um and certainly i've there's a, a really good matflix clip a couple of clips with um denise terran who is obviously the the doyen of homeopathy in the uk um and as a midwife and check out her expectancy web, web, um, website facebook page that's got a lot of information there also, it's uh, Pride Month, so lot, I've noticed lots of rainbows around. Um, and also, there's a lot going on in the elections. And I'm not going to go into politics. All I will say to you in the UK is make sure you vote. doesn't matter how you vote, just make sure you vote off the soapbox again. Um, and I wanted to just say a, a, a sad word for the loss of Michael Mosley, Dr. Michael Mosley, who many of you will have followed in his work as a doctor, as a TV doctor, but also he did a lot around nutrition and well-being. And, and he sadly died last week. And, and that was very tragic because he was comparatively young, very fit and a fantastic talent. And he'd been hugely missed by many, many people, including obviously his family and his friends. So um, condolences to all for, for the loss of Michael. Just lifting a little bit, here's your homework tonight. Lovely, lovely report out yesterday. The pool study, this water birth, huge, massive st uh, study that's been led by Julia Sanders and her team. And this is 73,000 women were in this study of looking at the benefits and, and the outcomes from using water in labour and in birth. And... It's in birth. This this is not associated with any um, increase in adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes, and I'm th I think that will be almost not a surprise to those of you who use water. Um, but it's good to have the evidence to back up what we talk to with women. Um, I think one interesting finding, and I haven't read it. I've I've just skimmed through it because I'm going to keep it for reading over the weekend when I've got a bit more time. But one of the interesting things was a, a sort of uh, perceived reticence about offering water birth to women by the health professionals, which was quite interesting. That might be to do with the lack of perceived evidence available, though there is a lot of evidence, as, as people who use water birth will know. But it's good to see this report because we've been waiting for this uh, research to be completed and the report to be out. So it's fantastic. So that's your bedtime reading. And that's all on the resources. You've got a, a fast link to that. It's free access, which is also fantastic, too. Now, I'm on perfect timing, so I'm very pleased with myself now. Now, this evening, we're going to be looking at the virtual midwifery caseload. And this is about bringing women's voices 
into the classroom. We really need to make sure our students are prepared for real life practice, knowing about continuity of care, knowing about what it's like to hold a caseload and provide really contemporary maternity care and actually be able to listen, plan care in part in real partnership with women. And this is really an exciting way of teaching and helping students learn in a very realistic way. So I'm delighted to be joined by two fantastic speakers who, who've done their moment of the week. Firstly, uh, Therese Shalosky, who's an associate professor and lead midwife for education, and she leads on the development, delivery and management of midwifery education within the School of Nursing and Midwifery. She's got extensive experience in curriculum design, development and approval across midwifery and nursing, and she's currently chief midwifery examiner overseeing the development of the NMC comp test of competence for overseas and return to practice midwives. There is more to both of our, our colleagues this evening online, but I'm giving you edited highlights because I want to have as much as possible in our virtual caseload. Also alongside Teresa is Claire Nutt. She's a midwife passionate about midwifery education, lifelong learning, perinatal mental health, salutogenic approaches, supporting public and wider voice and student mental health support. And her key roles are facilitation of the midwifery community partnership group, which combines the voice of student midwives, academics and local advocacy groups. And she's also been a practicing massage therapist for 22 years and continues to teach therapists, midwives and students massage skills. And she is, of course, an assistant professor in midwifery. I have to get the it's very important to get titles correct. And I'm going to say a huge welcome to Teresa and Claire. The screen is now yours and welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Oh, thank you, um, Sue. So we're um, I'm going to talk to you for about 15 minutes about the development of our virtual midwifery caseload. And then I'm going to hand over to Claire and she's going to talk to you about um, research study she did looking into the student midwife's experience of the virtual midwifery caseload <clears throat> we actually shorten it and we call it the vmc just for ease so sometimes i might accidentally say the vmc and that's what i'm talking about um, can we move on to the next slide please claire so i just wanted to give um, a little bit of uh, context around the development of this um, and just at the outset i want to um just recognize my uh, colleague at the time when we were developing, um, Emma Wapples. She's a midwifery educator currently working for the University of Staffordshire. So when I talk about we quite a lot at the beginning, it's myself and Emma, and then Claire joined the team a little bit later. So <laughs> uh, I could also be talking about we, Claire and I, but I didn't want to um, not acknowledge Emma's input into this. Um, so we're actually talking here about, it's not a standalone learning and teaching innovation. Um, the development of the virtual midwifery case, which I will explain as we go through, actually emerged from the development of a whole new programme and a whole new midwifery education portfolio at the University of Birmingham. So at the time of development, we were actually developing the um, MSc midwifery pre-registration short programme for adult nurses who want to become uh, midwives. And before we actually um, introduced this programme in October 2022, there was no education midwifery education programs at the university of birmingham there was lots of high quality research going on um, but no education so what that actually meant was that we had a fantastic opportunity which most lmes and midwifery program teams don't have which is we had no students uh, we had no existing programs so we had a, a, a reasonable amount of time we had lots of development to do but a reasonable amount of time to really explore and reflect on what elements what makes a really high quality educational experience for student midwives and what will actually bring high quality uh, midwives out into um, clinical practice. So that's um, that's sort of the, the context of the, the development itself. Thinking about the sort of nuts and bolts of it, there were a few drivers that presented us with challenges and opportunities. Um, when we were developing the programme, we'd been funded to develop a blended learning programme. Now, most of us were not used to uh, online platforms like this one today, uh, online teaching pre-COVID. So we needed to think about 
learning and teaching strategies that worked with students who were remote from us, who were having live sessions, but these sessions were um, over, a, 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 over Zoom or, or Teams um, as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> the programme had to desire, uh, align with the University of Birmingham strategic intent. So what that, that means is every university has a strategic document that says what they want to achieve for their graduates um, or for their research interests, et cetera. And for us, it was very apparent that the university, when they decided that they wanted to pursue a midwifery program, when they they um, employed myself and Emma, that they really wanted this program to develop leadership capability for impact. They wanted to develop research capability for evidence-based practice. Uh, they wanted some of our students to come back and work with us at the University of Birmingham for research. And they wanted graduates like lifelong learning, critical thinking, problem solving, et cetera. So sort of regular stuff that universities want but that was particularly what we wanted so nothing there really to to suggest to us that we particularly needed to bring women's voices in the into the classroom from those drivers and then we move on to the things that started to make us think about um how we were going to achieve some of our objectives and one of the main drivers for any university midwifery program is standards of proficiency for midwives the nmc standards and in particular there is uh, it's um, split into six domains and in particular there's domain two which looks at continuity of carer and how to give student midwives on graduation the foundation skills and knowledge that they need to be able to work in this model of care now at the time we were developing uh, nhs england was still actively trying to roll out continuity teams i'm not saying they're not now but this was pre Ockenden final report in fact the Ockenden report came out on the day that we approved our program where we found out that continuity of care teams may be being paused to some trust but anyway regardless we didn't know about this at the time we were developing um but all of the, the trust we were working with are at different points in their journey for developing continuity of care and some were further on than others so we couldn't actually at the time guarantee that all of our student midwives would have uh, placement experience in a continuity team so whilst we decided to continue to use um, case loading where students will look after a small group of women on a, uh, during a, their final year generally we started to think was there something that we could do in the classroom that would actually support the preparation of student midwives to go out there and work in continuity of care teams because whilst case loading would do some of it it wouldn't do all of it so that's when we started to need to think outside of the box one of our other drivers and driver in any program development was working with stakeholders so the two groups that were particularly influential in terms of developing this virtual midwifery case uh, caseload was our practice partners so clinical midwives um, and the other group were service users and advocacy uh, group representatives so our practice partners um, want lots of things, but thinking in particular about bringing women's voices in, they wanted our student midwives, they want all student midwives to be curious uh, when they, um, as midwives. So, you know, be curious about what is happening and why, you know, what, what, why is this woman bleeding or why, why is, um, uh, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? Why is this behavior happening? You know, why, why is this woman behaving in this way? What, what's going on in her life? You know, those sort of things. So sort of think about the, the whole, the sort of a holistic approach. They also, uh, and that's to do with safety, um, a lot of it to have a thinking midwife. Um, so their, their perspective was very much on safety. Also about reflection, thinking about why they've done things or why things have happened, but also as well challenge. They want student midwives to challenge, appropriate challenge, challenge themselves, um, challenge, you know, practice that is everyday practice that perhaps isn't particularly grounded in evidence, Ch you know, challenge poor practice, challenge, uh, you know, advocate for women, those sorts of things. So we were um, really starting to um, see a picture of what we needed to um, achieve, which was centering curiosity around centered around women as much as practice and then we went with our service users and our um advocacy group representatives 
we had a fantastically wide demographic. We had service users that were representing their own experience um, of maternity services, but we had, and we still do work with um, advocacy groups who um, advocate for different groups of women. So we had um, worked with bereavement charity, perinatal mental health charity, um, a group that works with women with larger uh, bodies, uh, pregnancy, sickness support, uh, and very closely with Birth Trauma uh, Association, uh, to name but a few. Um, and what they uh, told us was that we're asking that they wanted women to center the needs and desires of women in their practice. They want uh, midwives to listen, uh, to consider the context of their lives not just the pregnancy or the baby, they don't want to be invisible. They wanted midwives to inquire, just the same as directors of midwifery wanted to observe and to listen and to believe them. And really what they were asking for was individualized and personalized care. So we kind of, this all, you know, was moving together, coming together. And we started to think, well, how are we going to achieve all of this? And layering that on how we're going to achieve domain two, which is continuity of carer. So we thought about how, um, quite often we'll use experts by experience in the classroom leading sessions but obviously we're talking about crammed curriculum we can't have everybody in as much as we would love to or um, a lot of uh, uh, one of the main ways that midwifery tutors might teach is to talk about a, a particular subject gestational diabetes for example and then do some case studies at the end the problem with that is that the midwifery tutor is normally the one that chooses the case study. It's quite often based on their clinical experience, uh, sometimes shaped to fit the needs of the session, but it doesn't actually uh, provide the women's perspective. It's not her story. Um, so, and it doesn't really support continuity of care. We thought about using um, a learning approach called inquiry-based learning, which I've had lots of experience in, as, as Sue's mentioned at the beginning, where students will look at a case study and it can be a very uh, rounded case study. But uh, and they go away and they investigate it and they come back as a group and they they actually present their findings to the rest of the class. And we discuss their findings and we reflect on things. The problem is that's just a weekly case. study. that's one case study a week. And again, it doesn't specifically prepare students for continuity of care. And again, most often those case studies are made up by midwives, uh, midwife educators or, or uh, gained from uh, practicing midwives and sometimes by women. But they're not specifically about their experience and they're not usually told in the midwives, uh, the women's own words. So we really liked EBL. We wanted to build on that. And we were thinking about, OK, maybe we should think about using an unfolding case study because that will more closely represent what happens with the midwife that's working in a continuity team is that she gets to know that woman and she sees her regularly and things unfold. Um, so it sort of captures the, not only the context of the woman's life, but the dynamic nature of pregnancy and, and, you know, women's experiences and things. But again, it doesn't mirror the caseloading because it's one um, case that unfolds over a period of time. So we started to explore having caseloads running simultaneously. Can you move to the next slide, Claire, please? Um, so we, we obviously being uh, professor, associate professors and assistant professors, we, we hit the books and had a look to see, could we find anything out there that looked similar or the same as what we wanted? And what we, we couldn't find anything uh, exactly the same and what that uh, told us really was that either um, not many people are doing it or they're not publishing on it but there was enough to give us um, a positive picture that if you use uh, unfolding case studies and you use more than one of them at a time then it will have positive outcomes on learner experience and other uh, outcomes um, students really like to um have learning experience that reflect practice so that's a tick there um, we want them to have opportunities to revisit things as well and to see things in the round as I've mentioned we want students to have a safe environment in which to test their thoughts and ideas and so on and we want them to develop key graduate skills and what we did find which was most encouraging was that from the sm small amount of evidence that was out there that using 
simultaneous, you know, unfolding case study, uh, studies together, so that we could actually develop some of these case loading management and team working skills. Can you move on to the next slide, Claire, please? Um, so we decided to develop a simple framework to guide the development. In fact, this underpins the, the whole curriculum and other, we're, we're just about to start a, a BSc apprenticeship and this um, underpins that as well. So it's not just for the MSc programme. So uh, service users told us that they want midwives to centre women. We decided that if we can't expect midwives to do that if we're not centering women in student learning. So these are the, this is the golden thread then that runs through our programme that it's about women's uh, voices. Um, uh, all learning starts with women's voices and that lectures and seminars are organized around these case studies so that they complement women's stories, so they give the opportunity for us and students together to unpick. So for example, if we're using a case study of a woman who is perhaps uh, pregnant with twins and she has preeclampsia, and, you know, maybe she has other children at home, one with particular needs or so on, you know, that we can actually have lectures that revolve around that. So we can have a lecture on preeclampsia and we can have a lecture on uh, multiple uh, births and things like that. Um, so we obviously that that was a main premise. And and whilst we wanted to optimize sort of transformative learning and we, we were excited to be able to offer this on a digital platform as well, which really aligned with the fact that it was a blended learning program. We thought very carefully about the stories that we would use. So we decided that we needed to use case studies supplied by uh, women so that they were from their perspective. So we put out a call. Um, via some of the advocacy groups that we were working with and via a Facebook page. And we were absolutely inundated with women who wanted to share their stories. Um, most of them wanted to share because of what had happened to them. And they they wanted learning from that. It was important that, that there was learning from that. Um, but it, within these stories, there was high levels of trauma evident from uh, many women. And some of the stories were were quite harrowing, um, partly because they're written in their own words and you you open up an email and there's a story um, that you weren't expecting. But but in any case, um, we and there were obviously themes there, you know, poor communication, not listening, not believing, not using evidence based practice, all of the things that our stakeholders had told us we needed to think about in the curriculum. These women were just mirroring that. So we contact. We had to sift through them. Uh, we contacted. We thanked women. We contacted some of them to explore further with them if we could use their case cases in our virtual caseload. We met with them. We talked through their um, experiences. We wrote down the narratives. We talked about what we would need from them. So we would what the time commitment would be, what maybe the emotional commitment would be, because a lot of these women had not really worked through problems that they had experienced and then thinking about how we could support them further and this was something particularly when Claire came in with her background um, in perinatal mental health was how are we going to support these women because this is a learning experience for students but it's also an experience for women but anyway and then we had to order them and, and Claire has done a lot of that work because she leads our virtual midwifery caseload so if we have maybe students are looking at three to six cases a week we need to make sure that they're all beautifully ordered so that actually some of the content of those stories happen at the right time for that student in their journey or to coincide with modules. Um, uh, and so that was really quite uh, time consuming. Can you move to the next slide, please? Last slide for me. Um, so just thinking about uh, the, the detail here then, so it may not be clear at the moment. Hopefully the, the fact that we're using women's stories is clear, um, but we have put them together as a virtual caseload. So every week that students are in theory block, uh, they will open up this um, uh, virtual learning environment called LT, and they will have a little introduction that will tell them, these are the women that you are going to be seeing this week. And we try and, align the the virtual appointments along with antenatal care or postnatal care um or if it's in if if it's in labor we we 
uh, they maybe just have one woman that they look at that week and we will give them a sort of an unfolding story as they go through. So they open this up and then they click on the name of, of a woman and they see, uh, often they'll see a video and the video is of a woman in her own words telling the students about her uh, anticipated experience. So I, you know, I'm now 34 weeks pregnant. I'm just about to go and see the community midwife. These are the things that I'm, you know, this is what's happening, going on at the moment. Um, and they finish watching the video. We give them some clinical information as well. This is her blood pressure. This is her blood results. You know, don't forget to look back because you remember you saw her four, you know, four weeks ago. Um, and then we ask them to develop a plan of care. And when they've done that, they have to commit it. So they can't move on to the next page until they click a commit button. And that means they can't go back and change their mind about the plan of care. And then we show them another video where, where we have it with, of the woman then saying, OK, this was the experience I had. And actually, I really wanted to talk about and a really common one is I wanted to talk about the fact that I want a cesarean section as for my birth next time. And the midwife didn't ask me. She was more interested in asking me about smoking cessation and I don't smoke. So the students will see that again in the woman's own words. And then we ask them to go back and reflect. Did you did you miss anything? Because I know, you know because this woman is talking about her experience with the actual midwife in real life, but did they miss a cue perhaps? So it really gives the opportunity for them to think about their professional development. And then we, we meet with them once a week for a, a tutorial that lasts an hour and we will go through the stories with them and we will talk to them and they will talk about practice and we will talk about practice and then it all rounds nicely. Uh, and then they move on to the next week. And that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Claire now to talk about the research. Okay, thank you, Teresa. So, yeah, a part as part of a module evaluation, but also as um, to complete my own MSc dissertation, um, we engaged in an evaluation with the students of our first cohort. It was a kind of midpoint evaluation. We invited them to complete a questionnaire, which most of them did. In fact, nine out of 12 did, which was wonderful. And um, three students actually attended a semi-structured interview. So we really wanted to get um, some depth of what their experience was um, learning in this way. Um, and there were some key themes um, that emerged and some of these really will um, weave all the way through the student feedback that you'll be hearing. Um, they really shared that their learning experiences led them to feel prepared for clinical placement. And I think that probably is the, the, one of the strongest themes that we picked up um, from the VMC work that they did. It enabled a shared development of critical skills and of clinical reasoning. Um, it enabled them to feel like they were learning in a safe space. So they um, um, took part in a number of these activities in an independent, asynchronous way, um, and then came together as a tutorial on a weekly basis where the whole cohort um, joined one of us um, as educators and we facilitated and held space for them then to share their work. We gave sort of general feedback. We talked about specific themes um, that they had um, engaged with in, in that week. And that was also importantly a safe space for them and generated a community of inquiry um, but you know one of the things that really came through with this evaluation was this shared sense of learning that came from the emotional context of the narratives of, of how the women were portraying their feelings regarding their care not just what it kind of clinically um, was offered to them in, in their sort of antenatal appointments, for example, but also prompted them to consider how was their compassionate or, um, or not, how was it personalised or not, and they could um, kind of engage with their own thinking, their own experiences, um, and then reflect on those both personally as they got the feedback directly within their VMC work, but then also in the tutorial as well. So it's bringing that real life humanist perspectives into the digital platforms, bridging midwifery theory and practice-based learning and vice versa as they went out to practice, they then brought their experiences into their VMC work essentially. 
Um, so their perceptions, and, and this demonstrates some of the key terms um, for the benefit of those that will be listening on the podcast, as I usually do. Um, they really were able to draw, draw on some complex cases. They could really get a sense of women's own experiences. They could build on their own knowledge and skills um, and, and put these into practice. Um, and they felt a real sense of value in this um real life essentially um they were building on their current knowledge and skills for our, this cohort who were nurses becoming midwives um some of that transferability of their clinical experiences as well and in the sense of evaluating it um they really did evaluate the vmc work um extraordinarily well they found it involved well um as teresa mentioned it right it runs as a long thin module that really complements the shorter modules that, you ha that we have in universal care in enhanced care um in complex needs um and we were able to kind of really construct um, almost some flip learning, really, of setting them some activities that they had to seek some answers for themselves and then would go on to engage with that in, in more depth um, through the seminars and lectures, but then also through the, um, the tutorials, too. Um, they fed back that they felt engaged with this um, the VMC enabled them to figure out their own path within their learning. They could recognize some weaknesses in their understanding and seek um, kind of further resources and learning within that. Um, so one example um, of resources that we signposted them to as part of their VMC clinic, for example, there was one around hand expressing um, and they used that video resource that we I think it was a UNICEF one that we signposted them to. They then used that on the ward to support a woman that they were um, caring for antenatally. Another one used local breastfeeding support, signposting um, when they were on a postnatal ward. Again, getting to know the kind of local services and availability and the resources that they could then put in into actual practice. So they really felt they were able to expand on their own skills and knowledge, um, as one student said. Um, so some of the quotes that we gained um, in this feedback, I think it's really important to spotlight the student voice in this respect, just as we do spotlight the women's voices as well. Um, so one stated, personally, I feel learning from the lived experiences makes it, it more realist. It opens our eyes to what actually happens in areas through the maternity journey, it highlights needs for improvement and enables me to think back to practice and why some things might be carried out differently. So that context, again, um, adds that's something that is powerful and emotive to the, the learning that they're doing. Knowing that you know that people have taken the time to tell their stories was highly valued. Um, and students' exposure to lived experience in preparation for practice enabled them to reflect on where real services gave good or not so good care. And again, just some of the feedback that the students gave us in the sense of having more valuable women, um, finding more value in women's experiences than constructed teaching, particularly comments about the service provided or how the women felt after contact with midwives. It helped me to consider what I could do differently and what could be improved in the care that they received. And again, seeking value through seeing women talk about their experiences, you get a sense of how their birthing experience affected them. It feels more personal than being told or reading about um, how women feel. And, and, and again, in this sense, they could really kind of unpick the details in the these clinical and um, care experiences that enabled them to think about non-linear decision making um, demonstrated within branch learning allowing students to kind of manipulate their learning journey that and that authenticity of the videos really did um, enforce that and as kind of wider literature such as the Phillips et al um, study that um, Teresa mentioned earlier um, in the sense of uh, virtual clinics really um, being reflective of the different levels of practice experience that the students may have, whether it's in preparation for their first um, placement or um, that they're drawing on previous placement experiences um, in preparation for the next as well. Development of critical skills and clinical reasoning. What was important for the students is getting a deeper sense of those experiences, as we've already said, um, but also in the sense of thinking about what was more challenging as well. Um, as Theresa mentioned, um, many shared their experiences that were very difficult and, and what they perceived as, as traumatic. And we had to be very sensitive around these shared experiences, just 
not just from the women's perspective, although we did obviously need to hold space and make sure they were safe and felt protected in sharing their stories, but also from a student perspective, respecting um, that some of our students are um, mothers themselves that have had different clinical experiences that may have been traumatic. And so from a traumatic informed education perspective as well, again, we're very um, strongly um, in favour of creating a safe environment for them to share their learning, but also to feel personally safe as well. And it was really important um, to navigate that for them. So not knowing the um, the journey is not always a smooth or easy one for the students. And, and thankfully, they were honest in expressing that within this evaluation. Um, as one student shared, it can fa felt frustrating sometimes. And I think a few did feel this way, particularly when it was a new topic, a new area of care that they haven't experienced yet. So when there were um, topics, as this student said, that I felt I didn't know anything about or had not experienced in practice, trying to write a plan for something felt difficult and I needed to investigate what was out there to write the plan um, the process felt disjointed and time consuming that this could be seen as a positive so as part of her re reflective journey and her learning um, she then recognized why it felt difficult and her own emotions connected with that and actually kind of sometimes wading through or exploring or that curiosity that Teresa um, talked about was about being prepared much better for the practice situations so again as we've already said and uh, what was the objectives for the VMC was creating a safe learning space and then through the tutorial um, in the sense of that community of inquiry, managing that sense of anticipation, um, of really kind of thinking about the critical thinking and clinical reasoning, um, and the vicarious learning as well that was both anticipated and realised then through the tutorials, uh, sharing their experiences because they'd been on different placements, for example, or they're um, based in different trusts and the different um, kind of care experiences that might be associated with different hospitals. Um, and um, again, creating that space where they felt able to share even if they weren't really sure about what they were learning or, or what the answers were. So the tutorial was really kind of unpicking themes that were addressed in the VMC at the beginning. It might be in a bit more detail of going through things um, really case by case. But as LOA et al's sort of findings outlined, there was a sort of three layer model really for the design of virtual clinics. This inner layer that was around the student's cognition, the middle layer that was thinking about the virtual patient, the virtual woman as an encoded object to be decoded or as a kind of constructed activity, and then the outer layer that describes a sort of cognitive and behavioural change. So that that motion and that transition for the students and that kind of aligns to through the tutorial, having a social presence, so bringing the students in and back together, that cognitive presence in the sense of them sharing their learning, but also that vicarious learning, and then a teaching presence. So with having an academic present as a midwife with their shared clinical experience, but also in holding space um, in students be able to communicate together and developing those kind of shared communication skills as well um, was very much part of an ongoing activity and something um, I think the students really favoured um, in general from the feedback that they gave, um, especially where the, chase, the, the cases were challenging um, and particularly where they read and, you know, different resources were sharing their evidence based approaches. And so they're yeah, particularly at this level, at master's level, they were really sharing their critical thinking and unpicking things at a, a much deeper level. So just to summarise, um, the future of the VMC, we're constantly looking um, at how we can improve it. Um, I'm evaluating the next um, cohorts experiences and I'm, I'm going to be evaluating the, the second years, the, the ones that um, took part in this evaluation are now second year. So I want to seek how they're getting on in, in this year of their VMC work. We definitely need to consistently increase the diversity of women and families and their voices, um, reflecting more the local communities where these students are working and attending practice and those, those women and families that they are caring for, looking to sort of continue to develop the digital way that they engage with the VMC and technology um, and their digital skills, but also perhaps mimicking things like the Badgernet and the way that um, their documentation and practice takes part. Um, and again, just thinking to engage with feedback. So essentially the VMC personalizes learning experiences. Um, students can work independently. They can value being able to safely make mistakes, but essentially shape their own midwifery learning and their midwifery care by 
conducting perhaps a consultation that's not just mirroring or parroting what somebody or like a practice supervisor might might do, but also um, navigating their own kind of clinics in their own real time um, as a midwife themselves, taking the mechanism of that space and time frame to mimic a true midwifery experience. Um, and that's me. Your well, stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I have to say, I think I'm, I mean, I'm listening and thinking I'm very envious. It would be fantastic to do a program like this because it's very real. Um, and I guess in the olden days, you know, when some of us were in practice learning that, maybe it was easy because we were much smaller numbers and you, you'd work alongside your midwife. And maybe you didn't have as much time in, in, in school at that time either. And I was thinking as you were both talking about this module is really bringing everything together, isn't it? It's the kind of, it's the continuity, if you like, of, of threading it, all the theory together. And that makes it really exciting as teachers, as well as for students. So fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely fab. I'm just just thinking about. I, I was wondering actually, you were talking about Claire about um, your neck working on the next group. Are you are you kind of do you have a sort of bank of women's voices at which you can kind of pull in what you need for a particular cohort or just to combine? Because I can the only thing I could imagine is there might be some sharing and people might think, oh, well that's the same as last year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Theresa might be one to ask this, but Theresa and Emma, you know, spent a lot of time putting together yeah. a bank of, of different stories. And many of them were shared in different ways, like videos, perhaps some audio written stories. And I think that's got to be really respected in the way that women feel safe to share what their experiences have been like. But I have certainly been in touch and spreading um, with kind of listening events and MNVPs in the local region and other organisations that are very much much raising um, the voice of, of um, women, patient service users in, in lots of different healthcare environments and are very much poised to go out and regather. One of my favourite things, I, mean, I was a PMA, I, I'm a PMA and, you know, listening to birth afterthoughts and things like that and, and regarding perinatal mental health and kind of trauma informed education. It's something I'm really looking forward to. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the moment, we've got we have got a lot of resources that yeah. we've been able to yeah. with both both years cohorts, but um, just looking to develop that much further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was thinking from when, when Teresa was talking about and I think you explained it really well about looking after the women and that some of those women coming with stories that hadn't been resolved. I mean, do you have access to a specialist counselling and support services you can channel people through to? It's certainly something we needed to think about because yeah. I think that we hadn't really I mean you you learn a lot as you go along so we had a we had a sort of a consent process where where women agreed to be part of the caseload we would you know ensure that we weren't sharing their stories and that, that that we were very clear about what we were using their stories for but but initially what we didn't have was that framework for the the conversation that we would have with women um and this was something that we that I explored with Claire when she ca came on knowing that that's you know part of her mm. background but yes um a lot of it is sign then signposting women and and sensitively mm. you know because it's it's you can't just say to a woman I I think you need to continue <laughs> you no, know exactly are. and it's avoiding that sort of scattergun approach isn't it as mm. well of, of of throwing lots of different signposts out of actually taking mm. time to explore what's meaningful to that in that person individually and and their mm. kind of current experience and where they need to be so hold that sense of holding space and signposting mm. yes um, in and a being, sensitive way being very careful that because we're not a debriefing service. So everything mm. women told us, we wrote down faithfully and absolutely mm. believed every word of it, you know, mm. and that's what we represent to the students. So perhaps, perhaps, I don't know, this is another study, but perhaps there is mm. some, you know, se sense of ach achievement for them in terms of their story has been heard and believed mm. because we have no reason to, to do anything other than believe them. We don't have the mm. notes um you know all the sorts of things that 
perhaps they might be afraid that we would do. Mm. But I think, you know, moving forward, going back to your previous question, we we do need to continue to gather stories and not just because of the students, we don't want to keep recycling them, but also mm. because a lot of women were talking to us about experiences that happened to them during COVID. Mm. And obviously, you know, we, we need to, and that really shows quite starkly how services change. Mm. And so we need to keep up with the stories to keep up with services as they are. So we can't present mm. cases that are three, four years old. No, no because they just don't have the currency yeah. so yeah. it's definitely ongoing uh work and i think each time we're going to do it we need to then we can think about all of these elements that we didn't mm, mm. think about so much at the beginning mm. no absolutely um, well we have some questions from our audience <laughs> now forgive me if i turn around audience because all the questions and comments come on my other screen because this screen <laughs> otherwise I, I won't be able to see it all um, and so now the questions we have Ola. Hi, Ola. And she says, thank you, Teresa. I'm a student midwife and I'm required to complete a one to two case loading, which is very difficult because it's difficult to care for a woman in the community and follow up during IOL, induction of labour, I presume, and, physic and finally be physically present during the birth of the baby. What advice do you have to com help to complete this case load? Is it possible to complete one? From antenatal and then labelled. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, that very much depends on what uh, university have um, mm. approved with the uh, NMC. But I think we all recognise that case loading experience is very difficult. So she will have a program requirement that will tell her how many women she has to care for. Um, but um, if if we're caseloading doesn't always have to involve um, the birth unless that's what your university tells you. Mm. So I, I've, it's difficult for me to give advice in case because really it's a case of going back to a program lead and clarifying. But just to say um, we recognise how difficult it is. Um, and it's a case of working very closely with our practice supervisors and practice assessors to identify women mm. um, sort of early, early on. But yeah, I don't know if you've got anything to add there, Claire, but. No, that's it. It's very subjective, mm. isn't it? And there are additional challenges with being a student on call and, and how and when you can get to um, to women, depending on where they're choosing to birth. And mm. But I, I do think there's real value in a sense of your learning journey of, of having as much antenatal contact and postnatal if the birth is difficult to get to, mm. or even being part of that experience. If, if women are offered induction and, um, and choose to accept it, that could you be part of that experience as well? Because mm. from a, a woman and relationship centered approach that's really meaningful to them and that's Absolutely. what we're hearing that every Absolutely. contact counts literally and and at sometimes antenatal and postnatal can Definitely. mean as much to the mother Absolutely. that's lovely Absolutely. thank you so Ola you need to go back to your university and just check out what the requirements are before you kind of take it further but thank you for the question that was lovely now we have Juliet Samuel who's one of our regular audience hi Juliet and she says was VMC incorporated from the year one of the course yes yes, yes. not 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 week one week three <laughs> we <laughs> left <laughs> we introduced midwifery first <laughs> but it was it was launched in um as they began their universal care module so as they were being introduced to midwifery in general um then the, the VMC was launched with their first booking which yes. is quite early, but then that's very good, isn't it? It sort yeah, of but that's sends where... the importance of what, of what and and actually, exactly. if so, many of you who are watching this will remember being in school, in school or university, and being desperate to be out there meeting women and and families, and being very frustrated when you know you wanted to be doing things, and this sort of model really gives you some of the doing. Yeah. in a really good way so that's fantastic thank you now we've got Bieta Sikorska hi Bieta this is a comment and she says women do not always feel good especially when they see a different midwife at each visit good point many women would like their midwife to be with them during pregnancy after returning home from the hospital after giving birth 
to a child. Many women would like their midwife to take care of their sexual education, contraception or the menopausal period. Many women believe that midwives should not only play the role of people conducting pregnancy and childbirth, but also deal with the zone of intimacy, procreation, childbirth, as well as the woman's health. Menopause should be the responsibility of midwives mm. in whom they have the greatest trust and have that they feel understood that's wow. a really nice a nice point yeah. to make Pieta. and that's everyone's what... going yes yeah it's really interesting I think because in talking about global midwifery and the different roles of midwives we might be slightly mm. different in the UK but particularly you know in, in different areas of the world and I know you have students and midwives joining you from all over that mm. um that some midwives will very much be part of that whole preconception mm. care and like you said sexual health but uh, how, how many go to the menopausal support I would definitely be appreciating that at the moment but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, but certainly in preparation for and I think even things like our specialist pelvic health midwives for example are really having a strong role now in supporting women's um, physical mm. and psychological health for the long-term benefits of womanhood and I think that's really important to mm. consider. I love this care of womanhood, midwives <laughs> care of womanhood, wonderful. Okay, and Deirdre says, are women paid for sharing their experience? What is the time commitment from women? How do you manage any complaints about practitioners or services? Mm. Well, we definitely Good one. do. We do, <laughs> we do offer a payment. Not all women want to be paid. Mm. And we do talk to women about the time commitment. So, we, we, we are asking women to give as little or as much as they can. So some mm. women will be able to give us no, no videos and we just go on the narrative and that's what we present to students. Um, so we just have a meeting and we go through everything. Some some women will provide a, a video and a reflection, post-reflection for every single antenatal appointment wow. that they had, including visits to the obstetrician and all of their postnatal telephone care. calls yeah. everything really, really detailed deep. you know mm. this is it's it's eight o'clock I'm now you know they've just broken my oh, waters goodness. it's you know um it's really down to the women we're just grateful for everything that they uh mm. they offer us um we don't tend to ask women which trust that they um mm. were at and we have women because we do a lot of the work over you know they record videos on their phone and send them mm. into us and we have teams call with them. So if they are um, going to comment about individual practitioners and things, we, we we don't, we can't engage with that. We don't, we, we listen, mm. obviously, and we can mm. just suggest that they, you know, the normal routes for taking that further. Mm. But we don't know even which trusts they're at, most of them. So, um, mm. but yeah, so sometimes there's, a, there's an there is, you know, there is comment about the midwife's behaviour mm. as a, in part of the story. And, and I think we just have to accept that as a profession, we do fantastic things. But sometimes, mm. you know, things don't always go as well as we would like. Um, yeah. But on that note as well, I think it's really important part and as part of the caseload is that we really celebrate and model excellent um, aspects mm. of care and really unpick what those are and what they mean for women but also what they look like in the sense of mm. the words that are used how communication is navigated what has made um, that women feel cared for and and feel that her care is compassionate as mm. well as where it, it isn't and mm. and I think to have that imbalance from a learning perspective is also really important and I guess learning when you get something wrong what you can do about it mm. with the woman and that's like, okay yeah. you know to a certain yeah. extent to get to get something wrong mm. obviously recognizing the um, safety factors but again that's where the vmc works as a safe space um, mm. to be able to do that and to do that um, in an open way fantastic now i'm very conscious of times chasing along with us <laughs> and i'm trying to get through but, but all of these uh, aims this is joe d'augustin hi joe and she says this all sounds wonderful thank you for sharing your work Question, how do educators share, stroke, learn about such initiatives? Does NMC facilitate this? Well, Joe, we facilitate it. And I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure NMC do. And this will be I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm speaking for Claire and Teresa. Sorry. That's Should okay. Be... We Ooh. presented to the lead midwife for education group regionally. <laughs> um we presented at Net Net Conference. So we're we're out there sharing. 
Um, but yes, we are trying to, and there's a lot of interest from other lead midwives for education on this. Mm. Um, they're, they're just trying to work out how it's going to work. We have a small cohort because we're a new program. Mm. There's some logistical issues mm. for some of the very big programs to work through, like, like the tutorial. How do they facilitate mm. that? Mm. Um, and it's very time consuming mm, to do all this uh, program. Yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing to do. Yes. That's what you can and... do when you only have one group of students <laughs> or now two groups, you know. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Fantastic. Mm. Okay, Kat, Kate Frith. Hi, Kate says, really great presentations. Thank you. I have three que three questions. That's a bit greedy, Kate. <laughs> she says, How many students did you have in the weekly tutorial discussion group? That's number one. Mm. Well, our, our cohorts are quite small. So in the first uh, group, there was 13. We did initially split them into two, um, which did work well. But actually, they found they learned so much vicariously. They wanted to be all together as a big group, but with more time. So instead of having two one hour tutorials, we, we brought them together as one big two two hours. And we could do it all day. I think if we <laughs> carried on sometimes, it's such a rich um, session. <laughs> My goodness. OK, question two from Kate. At what stage in the course do you introduce the virtual caseload? I think we've done that. That was three mm -hmm. weeks in, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. so yeah. I was, was, was listening. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> part of the first, first universal care module. Fabulous. And then third question, Kate, being very greedy, Kate. Um, did you say that you recorded videos of real women for the caseload? Did you use actors with the women's words? No. no but we would we have thought about that though because we mm. have role players at the university we, so um i think for those that would rather write their narratives and that we because that's re again really helpful because we use the role players in clinical skills weeks mm. what i'm really keen to do is that the that transfers then to our actual clinical skills with a real story mm. behind it somebody right. that they yeah, recognize that's, that's, that's... where possible we want we want authentic voices yes mm. yeah yeah, that, that's fantastic. And then Juliet Samuel, in, again Juliet, says, "What are the of the possible effects on the students' experience journey, the impact and subsequent perception of midwifery and care provision?" Well, that's what we're that's what we're sort of finding okay. out from the mm. yeah from the evaluation. Yeah. But we, you know, at the moment everything looks positive. We're we're really just trying to instill this central understanding of centering women you know um it's difficult isn't there when there's you know there are small ways that you can center women even if you are strapped for time you know mm. and, th and these women when they give their reflections they support that you know so without going into lots of examples but there are just little things that i think our students hopefully will mm. you know assimilate into their practice um, and it's but, so but good what? in so many ways, though, because you're you, you, even the things around consent and, and confidentiality that you've got kind of threading and, and holding the whole thing together. So the students presumably know that they don't go and talk about the cases in the local cafe, yes. you know, and everyone's <laughs> here. So, I mean, that and that that sort of learning is so important because, you know, when you hear someone on the bus talking about something very personal about somebody else it's very well it makes you very anxious because you think are they going to talk about me like that yes absolutely we do not want them watching those videos on their phones on the bus <laughs> <laughs> no that's absolutely absolutely do you know this hour and i always say this this hour goes the quickest 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 in the whole week and this week is is no exception it's been fantastic I'm, I've learned so much about how this works and I know that the audience have been very engaged in this and really interested. And thank you to all of you who are watching for your participation, your fantastic questions. And for Kate for three and for Juliet for two. Well done. Thank you for that. It's really lovely to have that interaction. And so big, big thanks to Claire and Teresa for giving up their evenings to share all this innovation and, and things to really make us think about how we teach and how we learn and that's not just as student midwives but also as midwives mm -hmm. how we can really learn to engage and listen to women's voices and family voices and next week it'll be babies' voices mm -hmm.
which is harder to listen to because they can't tell you what the problem is. They can they communicate in other ways. Now, I want to say a big thank you to Angelo. Now, Angelo is behind the scenes making sure this is all beautifully recorded. And so that first thing on Friday morning, this will be available as a podcast. For those of you who like a six o'clock in the morning podcast, it'll be ready. It'll also be ready <laughs> next week for you to access, which is great, alongside the um newsletter that will come out so that'll be there for you and next week we've got we're going to be looking at examination the newborn and we're going to look at problems with the upper arm and we've got ruth lester speaking who is a consultant retired consultant plastic surgeon alongside a midwife educator again so you're getting lots of education this week now i have to say don't forget to book if you're not if you haven't for the Northern um, Festival that's next Tuesday. And also we've got the Southwestern Festival in Bath on the 17th of September. You might want to book for that as well because we have some very good speakers. I think you'll agree when you see. So thank you again to Teresa and Claire. In the meantime, everybody else, take care of yourselves and we'll see you back here next week, same place, same time. Take care.